Oh, do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Do Lord, oh, do Lord, do remember me. Look away beyond the blue. Well, I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Look away beyond the blue. Oh, do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Look away beyond the blue. Jesus came to show the way, truth and Jesus came to show the way, the truth and the light. Jesus came to show the way, the truth and the light. He came for me and you. Oh, do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Look away beyond the blue. Shane them all, come on, man. Gary Johnson. Took Jesus says my Savior, you can take him too. I took Jesus says my Savior, you can take him too. I took Jesus says my Savior, you can take him too. While he's calling you, oh, do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Do Lord, oh, do Lord, oh, do remember me. Do Lord, oh, do Lord. You may be seated. This is going to be number 106. I am free. We need your help on this one. Oh, yeah. 
you the battle's won Through you I'm not afraid Through you the price is paid Through you there's victory Because of you my heart sings I'm free! I am free! Yes I am free! I am free! Yes I am today is that if you're in this place you are free I love it that's what we want we want to promote in this place is that Jesus radical grace that if you're here you belong that no matter what you're going through in life what you've been through what maybe is going on right now or what may be around the corner that if you're in this place you're accepted that in this place it's okay to not be okay we're so glad that you're here with us today and that we're free in Christ so that's such a great song. Thank you guys, man. Love that. Love it. My name is Joe Brantley, and I'm the campus director here at Central Florida, Bama. We are so excited that you're tuning in, and we want to welcome you in as being a part of our ministry. Uh, another way you can help be a part of our ministry is through donation, and we want to encourage you to donate. Go to centralonline.tv and select the Florida, Bama campus. You can also purchase my church is at the Florabama t-shirt that is a really cool shirt you could be sporting around in your hometown I want to encourage you to do that all the proceeds from the donations go to fish for men and women also we want to come alongside of you and we want to pray for you so any prayer concerns please email me so we can pray for you let us know how we can pray for you and also we want to rejoice with you if there's a praise please let us know because we want to celebrate those praises with you as well so please just anything that you would need let us minister to you in any way that we can eat just send an email to me and we would just love to love on you and make you closer and feel closer to here with us at the floor of Bama ministry now here's something else that we really enjoy doing each and every week we have people who all over the country that travel to be here with us and so we we'd like to give you a little gift if you're a first-time guest and you traveled the furthest to be with us we have this nice my church is at the floor of Bama sure I mean look at that thing that bad, you could rock that bad boy right now you can see it right you, you want it you know it some of you are gonna cheat and say you're from further than you really are I get it there's forgiveness in that like I said it's okay to not be okay so uh, but anyway here's what we want to do if you're a first-time guest and you traveled the furthest to be here shout it out and we're gonna give you this shirt Wisconsin Washington State that's a long way San Diego oh my gosh Washington State's further Donna said so I'm going with Donna anybody further than Washington State anybody from Alaska okay if you are you're homesick right now because it's hot isn't it <laughs> hey we want to thank you thank you for being here Washington State you guys hey here's what I want you to do there are people from all over the place here just visiting with us today so I want to challenge you to do this everybody stand up and I want you to go find somebody that you've never met before and welcome them and thank them for being here today hey Joe
page 98. In your hymnal there. There's a place where I love to run and play. There's a place where I sing new songs of praise. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. There's a place where I lose myself in Him. There's a place where I find myself again. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. There's a place where religion finally dies. There's a place where I lose my selfish pride. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. I love my Father. Father loves me. Dance for my Father. Father sings over me. I dance for my father, my father sings over me. And nothing, nothing can take that away from me. Nothing, nothing can take that away from me. I said nothing, nothing can take that away from me. Come on, nothing. Nothing can take that away from me. There's a place where religion finally dies. There's a place where I lose my selfish pride. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. The minor reminder. The minor reminder. <laughs> We got a new song. We we just learned it. <laughs> Page number twenty. It's called uh, "You Are So Good to Me." If you're a follower of Jesus, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Well, you are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song. I will sing again You are so good to me You heal my broken heart You are my Father in heaven You are so good to me you heal my broken heart You are my Father in heaven You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song You ride upon the clouds You lead me to the truth You are the Spirit inside me Sweet song. You are beautiful, my sweet, 
sweet song And I will sing again Well, good morning, everybody. How we doing? Good. We're glad you guys are here. Nice and toasty. Woo, yeah. Well, if this is your very first time here, I know Joe said welcome, but I wanted to welcome you. My name is Dan, and I am the pastor here at the floor of Bama. So welcome to all of you guys who are maybe coming through town, or um, this is just you live in the area, and this is your very first time. You came on a great week for a couple of reasons. You missed uh, in between services, but we had an awesome time. We were down at the beach baptizing our good friend Ed Lang, and uh, man, it was beautiful. If you ever hear here that we're doing a baptism, you've not been able to be a part of it or it's been a while since you've been a part of it. We don't have any happening after this service, but anytime you hear say baptism, come down. It's, uh, it's one of those things that I get to do. It's my honor to do. It's very emotional. It's an awesome time. It's a marking in somebody's life. So now um, if you're interested in baptism ever, you guys just let us know. We'd love to chat with you about that. A few minutes ago, Joe was up here. And uh, those of you guys who don't know Joe, um, you know, this is your first time, you're not really connected with him. Um, but those of us that do know Joe, if you know him, you love him, right? If you know Joe, you love him. And we're super pumped for Joe because uh, two weeks from today is actually um, Joe's last day. Not exciting for us as a team or as a church family, but at the same time, I mean, it's pretty amazing because Joe is heading back um, kind of home to Calera, Alabama, where Joe has taken a senior pastor role at a, the church um, that he was attending and eventually on staff at before he came out to hang out with us for the last year um, called Concord Baptist Church. So Joe's going to be taking that role. We're super grateful for you, Joe, and all you've given here. We're going to miss you like crazy, but the good news is we've got two more weeks with him. And, uh, and if, you've been, if you're like me, you know, I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm kind of a last minute person. So, but don't be last minute if you know Joe and um, he's affected your way in a, in a positive way at all. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but if he's, if he's affected your life, in any way, don't wait until a day before to try to make a quick phone call. Today, grab them, give them a big hug, tell them how much you love them um, because we've been so grateful, Joe, for all you've done here yeah. at the church. Thank you, man. We're going to miss him, but he's only four hours away. And so I'm sure he'll be making some trips down to the beach here and there. Well, we've been in a series that we're calling uh, the seven deadly sins, Ooh, you know, um, and that's never something somebody wants to talk about. Even though we all face temptation and mistakes and screw-ups in our lives, we don't really want to talk, who really wants to talk about sin? Nobody really wants to talk about sin, and I'll tell you why that is. 
because usually when sin is brought up, the word sin, um, the reaction to people who are sinning is it's usually a negative reaction to those people, you know? Even ourselves, sometimes we get a little judgmental of people that are off doing something that we wouldn't do the way that we would do it. But here's what I love about Jesus. Biblically, as you read the story of Christ, that's not how Jesus reacted to people who made mistakes, who did wrong. As a matter of fact, it was just the opposite. When Jesus was in front of people who others called sinners and, you know, they're unholy and unclean people, others were very negative. But in fact, Christ showed mercy and grace and love. And so that's the great news about what we're talking about is we're not talking about these seven deadly sins, these seven sins that can really destroy our lives so that we can get beat down and discouraged about how much of an idiot we are. You know, last week, I, I mean, I'm the one up here preaching last week and I left the service feeling like, oh man, I got some work to do, you know? And, and we should, we should feel like, hey, every day my goal, I wake, I wake up and I say that to my kids, our goal is to live more like Jesus today than we did yesterday. That's our aim, right? That's my aim. I want to reflect Christ more. And those of us who are Christ followers, if you're a Christian, that's our aim every day to reflect Christ a bit more today than we did yesterday. And so, but when we look at all the things that we've done wrong, it's easy to get detoured away from how good God's grace is and his love is because oftentimes what do we see? Our mistakes, right? We see our mistakes. Now there's a verse in the Bible that I want to bring up. It's actually not in your programs, but if you have a program, all, most all the verses, except for this one, I'm going to be reading are going to be right in here. So if you don't have one, just shoot your hand up. We'll get you one. Um, there's a verse in the Bible that I didn't put in your program, that if you've been around the church at all, or even if you grew up in the church, you've been in the church for a couple of years, you may have heard before, you may not have, but you may have, it's in the book of Matthew, and Jesus is preaching this sermon, and it's this really great sermon actually, starts in, in ch chapters five and six, and goes to eight or nine, and Jesus is laying out for us a way to live. You know, he talks about all kinds, he talks about relationships, he talks about um, how we deal with the poor, um, he talks about loss in our lives, he talks about lots of different things. Now, right in the middle of it, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, but it's because he was on a mountain and he preached a sermon, you know. And he, right in the middle of it, he says something very interesting that has been, unfortunately, very, very misinterpreted and plucked out and used against people that have ever sinned, which includes me and all of us here. Then here's what the verse is. You may have heard it before. It says that wide is the road that leads to destruction and many are they that find it. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Else? And then he follows it up by saying, but narrow is the road that leads to life and few are they that find it. And we're really good, especially in the church sometimes, of saying, see, there's a few real holy people and they get in to heaven, but there's a whole bunch of people. You think you're good, but you're not good, and there's this huge highway to hell. And so it's as if heaven is gonna be a few of us, and then hell is gonna be just populated with way more people than that. And if you look at it like that, you can see, oh, okay, you've heard that before, you read the verse, that makes sense, that's what it means. Here's, what I, here's my favorite part about the whole thing. Whoever usually is saying that verse, like reading it, they're part of the narrow club that gets in. You notice that ever? You know? Us holy people, how about you guys? You know? But you have to eliminate everything Jesus said before that and everything Jesus said after that to even come up with the idea that God, uh, or through Christ, is talking about heaven and hell. He's not talking about heaven and hell. He's not talking about our eternal life. He's talking about our here and now. So there is a road, a big, broad road that you and I can choose and it's pretty destructive. And we could list any of these seven sins that we've been talking about. Pride. Pride will lead to a destructive life. 
Forget about the hereafter. I'm talking about right now. And it's real easy to be puffed up and prideful. That's why it says that the road is wide and many find it. It's an easy path. It's easy to live an envious life. It's, as a matter of fact, right before Jesus said that the road is wide, that leads to destruction, you know what he talks about? He talks about loving others as you love yourself, treating others the way you would want to be treated. That's a hard road, isn't it? It's much easier just to love yourself and to be kind to people who are only kind to you. That's a wide path. It's easy to love people who love you sometimes. You know, it's easy to love most people that love you back. It's hard to love your enemy. That's a narrow path. That's a narrow path. And it, what it does not mean is if you choose today to uh, not love your neighbor as yourself, you're on this wide path and God's kicking you out of heaven, you end up in hell. What he's saying is it's destructive. It's a destructive way to live. And today we're going to finish up the series with two of the seven, which is a little bit dangerous to attack two of these things. Now, there's going to be a temptation throughout all seven of these to do this, because I do it too. There's this temptation is while you're listening to us talk about, today we're talking about laziness or slothfulness and greed and selfishness, to think of maybe two, three people that should be here listening to this message. Oh, I know. This guy needs to be hearing this message. And maybe they do, but really this is for us. We showed up today. So here's what I believe. Whether you believe it or not, it's okay. I am convinced that none of this interaction that you're gonna have today, no verse I'm gonna read is some freak accident, it was just an invite, or you came to have a drink and you ended up at the church. I don't think any of that is an accident at all. Now, you may wanna, your temptation may be, your first reaction be like, I'm gonna take all these notes because when I get home, I'm gonna be re-preaching Dan's message to, you know, <laughs> that may be, but really, this is for us. And there may be some other people that need it, but we need it. Those of us that are here need it. Now, most people would never categorize themselves. Now, you know, I said last week we talked about wrath, which is defined as extreme anger. I'll, I'll be the first person to raise my hand and say, man, I lose my temper, right? I lose my temper. And most of us are willing to admit that we might categorize the self as we may have a problem with anger sometimes or maybe we're a little envious of people sometimes or prideful. Or any of these, the, the, the five that we've already talked about, very few people categorize themselves as lazy, greedy people. No one really puts that on a resume that doesn't come up in a date. Can you describe yourself? Oh, I love long walks on the beach and I'm pretty lazy if you want to get right you know, um, so we don't, that's not really something we, but you'll, you'll quickly admit, you know, sometimes I lose my temper. Are you greedy? No, I'm not greedy. Are you lazy? No, I'm not, I'm not lazy. And so though these two topics, you may not feel like, I may not feel like they apply directly to me. I think I'm going to ask a couple questions that will help it apply to all of us. And though they seem like they have nothing to do with each other, I think they have a lot to do with each other. Laziness and greed, slothfulness and greed. So let me start by making these two statements and we're going to break them both down for a couple minutes. Greed says this, I have to have it and I want it now. You become the center of your life. I want it, it's mine, me, for me. And then laziness, though it doesn't say the same thing, laziness says, I, I don't have to do it and I don't want to do it. Now if you'll notice, both of those thoughts center around who? Me. Yeah, me. Whether it's I have to have it and I want it now, or I don't have to do that and I don't want to do it, either way, what starts to happen is people who bend towards greed or bend towards laziness, the bubble of their life actually gets really, really small until it eventually only includes them. It only really includes them. 
Now there's a verse right in your program in the book of Proverbs written by um, a wise man, wise king actually named Solomon, Proverbs 19.15. It says this, Slothfulness casts into a deep sleep and an idle person will suffer hunger. Interesting what Solomon says here about laziness. Actually, there were so many verses about idleness, laziness, slothfulness. Um, we could have spent two weeks just talking about that. But, it, but here's what Solomon's saying. Do you see what slothfulness leads to? A destructive life. Cast into the deep sleep. In other words, you're just, you're not doing anything ever. And an idle person will suffer hunger. It's a very wide road that laziness and slothfulness offers you and me. It's a really wide road. And, it's, and a lot of people find that road. And the end leads to hunger, destruction. Right? I know you're already thinking about somebody who needs to hear this message. Somebody else, right? Because you don't consider yourself lazy. And I'll be really honest with you. I don't consider myself lazy either. But I do know this. I do know this. I can say this about myself. I don't know about you, but I can say this about me. I don't consider myself lazy, but there are areas of my life that I've become lazy in. I wouldn't say I'm lazy, and you may not say that about yourself either. You may be a very hardworking individual, determined individual, but I can look at my life and I can so, even though through it all, even though I feel like I'm a hardworking guy, I'm a determined guy, I can see a couple little lazy spots in my life. And you may not even, they may not jump to your mind, so let me ask it another way. One way to ask it is, is there an area of your life where you've been lazy? Another way, is there an area of your life where you've given up You've kind of given up and you've backed away and threw the towel in. Is there an area of your life in a relationship where you, you've just kind of quit on it because you're not getting from it? Is there a dream in your heart and it's been in your heart for a long time and it's not been out here, you haven't been able to do it, so you just kind of threw the towel in on it. You've given up on it. And I know you wouldn't consider yourself lazy, but what's the ultimate form of laziness? Completely just quitting. Now, what I'm not talking about is some abusive, violent relationship. I'm, you guys understand my heart, right? I'm not talking about being wronged horribly and you just have to leave that situation, that job or whatever. What I'm talking about is something in your heart that you want to do and you've given up. And you're saying, you know what? I don't have to do this and I don't want to do this anymore. I don't have to do this and I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired of being in a relationship where I have to give. I'd rather be in a relationship where I can get from that relationship. I'd rather be in a situation where I'm just getting. That's what slothfulness will do. It'll lead you to destructive relationships. You stop giving in relationships and you look to get from a relationship. Your dream that's in your heart that you've wanted for so long, you just kind of give up. And you end up being miserable because you gave up on the very thing that you wish you could do. Well, greed's much the opposite, it seems. It seems as if a lazy person is not ambitious to get. But in fact, what happens with greed, it's also this very wide path. It's very easy to jump onto. And life becomes about yourself to the point where any relationship that you have, you know, your bubble's so small, if you let people into your sphere, why do you let them in? To see what you can get from them. See what you can get from them. It's interesting sometimes how slothfulness and greed, laziness and greed can be so connected because the world starts becoming about you. Greed says, I want it, I have to have it, and I want it right now. And what I want you to understand, what I'm not talking about is whether you have a lot or you don't have a lot. Have you ever met someone extremely greedy that had nothing? 
I have. So, it, and I've also met extremely greedy people that have a lot. So, greed has nothing to do with, the, with your monetary, you know, um, your net worth or the amount of money you have in the bank. It has nothing to do with that. Greed holds on so tight that you will not let go of what it could be a relationship, it could be a thing, it could be um, security for the future, whatever it is. I always say it like this. Greed, the epitome of greed is holding on to something, something, whatever it is, so tight that if God were to ask you for it, you'd have a hard time saying yes to it. Now, again, you and I don't throw greed, like, yeah, I, I tend to be greedy, you know, we don't really say that often. So maybe a better way to ask that question is this. Is there anything in your life, a person, a thing, like a home or a car or an amount of money that you want to have in an account or is there anything that you own that you're holding so close fisted that if God himself were to ask you for it you'd put up a fight it's a pretty good question I think it's a good question it's a question I have to ask myself often it's a question I have to ask myself often what laziness will do it'll make the, your life so about you the bubble is so about you that to step out of it is almost impossible. Of that, whatever that thing is, you, you've convinced yourself so much that you don't have to do that, you don't want to do it. To do it would almost be this, I mean, nothing short of a miracle. And that bubble's real close and you're not going to... And greed, same thing. You're, you're holding on to something so tight that if God were to ask you for it, so maybe a good question about greed is this. Is there anything you're holding on to so tight that God would have to argue with just to, for you to release it to him? Now here's a great thing. God may never ask you for it. He may never ask you to give that thing away. He may never ask you for that thing, for, for it to no longer be yours or to give up that he may never ask it. What he's not asking for is you to give it to him. He's asking for it not to have. There's this, great, there's this great saying. I heard it years and years and years ago. Greed is not about having stuff. Greed is when that stuff has you. Does that make sense? Greed is not about having things. It's when things have your heart that you've stepped over into greed. Is there anything that has your heart? Is there anything that has my heart? Is there anything that we've placed above Christ, a thing, in our lives? The first week of this series, you may or may not have been here, but I talked about how the enemy will throw bait, bait, B-A-I-T, bait, out in front of us. Now, when I go fishing, and if you've ever gone fishing, the idea is you know, you're not supposed to let the fish know that there's a hook in that bait, right? You don't let them know. What they don't know is there's a hook in it, and then attached to that hook is this line that goes up to this rod, and I'm on the end of the end of that rod, right? What we want them to do is take a bite, and we hook them, and we reel them in. And I said the enemy, our spiritual enemy, Satan, the devil, he he's, does the same thing. He'll dangle this bait out in front of us, and he'll want us to bite. And oftentimes we don't realize it, but there's a hook inside that temptation. And he's just waiting for us to nibble, bam, and then he's going to hook us and he'll reel us right in. What he does is he reels us down the wide path that leads to destruction. Our job is to be able to recognize the bait. Yeah, that's the enemy. That's our spiritual enemy coming after us. What greediness and slothless ladies will do it dangles right in front of us and without realizing it, we bite because it feels great for life to be about myself. It's almost natural, isn't it? Isn't it kind of natural to be a little selfish? I love getting my way. Can I just tell you? I love it. Oh, I just lost my shoe. The same thing happened last week. The Olympics have been going on. Anybody been watching? Any true patriot? I'm just kidding. 
I'm kidding. It was a joke. I love the Olympics. I love watching Michael Phelps dominate in the pool. It's been really fun this year. Lindsay and my kids, they love watching gymnastics and all, all the really cool stuff. And then I watch sports I don't care about the rest of the year, like handball, who cares, field hockey. I know the rules. I'm obsessed, you know. And um, if, you, if I wanted to, the TV could be on all day and night. And it's once every four years, and I want to watch it. Yeah? But there's six other people in my house besides me, five kids and my wife, and they want to watch other things too. And it's real easy for me to get annoyed. I don't lash out and freak out, but I just get annoyed when things aren't the way I want them. I don't know if you're that way or not. I have no clue if you're that way or not, but I get that way. They want to watch some, you know, dumb kids movie or something we've seen 5,000 times. This is once every four years. Do you understand, son? You know, my four-year-old, do you understand? <laughs> and I can, I can feel, I can almost feel the bubble of my life shrinking till it's about me. That's what greed and slothfulness will do. Greed and slothfulness will sneak in because it just feels good to do what you want to do when you want to do it. To push off the responsibility and be lazy. To give up on that dream or that idea or that relationship. It feels nice, you know, to have what you want and to get it when you want it. So greed does. And sometimes we don't even see the bait dangling right in front of us. So a really good question is, how do we get away from that? How do we, how do we turn our back to the wide path and head towards the narrow path? I want to close by telling you this story about Jesus at dinner one day. And he was surrounded at this dinner table by a bunch of religious people. They happen to be very pious and arrogant people. Have you ever met any religious, pious people? No? Okay. Just me? I've just met them? Okay. But they're, they're saying statements like, oh, we can't wait till one day we're up in heaven eating at the, uh, at, you know, the, the supper in the kingdom. And, you know, they're talking about the hereafter and... And Jesus tells this very interesting parable. Now, a parable is a story about some natural thing, a tree or a, a fish or a tent or, you know, a microphone, and, but it has a spiritual meaning to it. So he tells, or at dinner, he tells a dinner story. He says, there was this man who owned this great home and all kinds of things, and he's throwing a party. And he invites, he sends out all these invites, and these invites go out to all these people, and hardly anybody shows up to the party. And so he's like, Master, there's not many. There's one of the people that was one of his employees. Hey, boss, man, like, there's nobody here. Uh, what do you want to do? We don't want to serve the food yet. There's nobody here, but it's getting cold. What should we do? And he says, well, go out and invite some people. Go get them. Remind them that the party's right now, today. So they go out, and a few people come, but... It's still, there's a ton of room left. So if you got your program, it's the last verse. Luke 14, it says this. This is the boss saying to his employees, go quickly into the streets, alleys of the town, invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported there's still room. So he, listen, he goes out and invites a bunch of people that were not actually invited to the party. They, they didn't get an invite. And it was people that most people don't invite to parties. People that need special attention. People that didn't look the part, dress the part, or act the part. So he says, hey, there's still room. So the master said, go out into the country lanes, behind the hedges. Urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. Story about dinner. But Jesus had this very profound spiritual meaning that seems like it has nothing to do with what we're talking about today, but here's exactly how it has everything to do with what we're talking about today. The enemy, I said a moment ago, wants to dangle bait in front of us. That's his purpose. As a matter of fact, John 10.10 10 says, the thief, our spiritual enemy, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Why does the path that leads to destruction? The enemy's job is to destroy our lives, and he will hook us and reel us in down that path. He's got a purpose. The way you combat the enemy's purpose is by running after Christ's purpose for your life. And here's what he said 
to all these people at dinner that day. Go out and share this idea that there's this table and anyone can come. It doesn't matter if you're spiritually lame or crippled or life has smacked you and left you hurt. You've lost someone and you're in deep pain. You're invited to come. People who are strangers to you or neighbors to you, invite them to come. Christ is saying to us, every day you're around people. People in this world that have been hurt, that have, they think there's really no hope after this life. And he's sending you and I out to, to be carriers of his hope and to let them know the dinner table's, dinner table's open for anyone who wants to come. See, they were saying, I can't wait until I get to heaven to have dinner like this in the kingdom. They were focused on who? Themselves. And Christ turned it around and said, man, this isn't about you getting to heaven and you being one of the few chosen on this narrow road. This is about you going out to the people around you and saying, you're welcome to dine with Christ. You're welcome to forgiveness and love and acceptance. You're welcome to come and you can come with me. And you can list the two that we're talking about today or the five others we talked about the last few weeks. How do you get yourself, how do you prepare yourself to be on the road that very few find? You make your life about others. You allow your bubble to expand and you enter your life into the lives of others. You go out and be a carrier of hope for the world to see. Are you going to live, are you going to all of a sudden you start doing that, all seven of these sins start falling off your life? No. No. But it will be much harder and you'll be able to see clearer the enemy's bait when we're focused on the life that Christ has for us. And I don't know what your tomorrow is going to look like or what five years from now is going to look like. And I can't tell you your specific, um, the specific plan God has for your life, but I know one thing that he's got planned for all of us to be a carrier of hope to people without hope. Let me say a prayer for you. Well, Lord, I'm so grateful that you have not given up on us. And Lord, there's areas of my life where I've just kind of given up. I've gotten lazy. I need to step it up. Because that path leads to destruction. There are those of us that have given up on dreams and ideas. We've given up on relationships and friendships. And we've given up on some things. Our health. Lord, it's time we take a step up. And Lord, there's areas of my life where I've just gotten so greedy, man. I want it to be all about me. So my prayer is that you'd show all of us areas in our lives where we've become lazy or given up. You'd show all of us areas in our life where we've become greedy and we're living close-handed on the things that we own. But even more important, Lord, I pray that our eyes would stay focused on your purpose for our lives. Because there's a world around us that's hurting and without hope. May we choose the narrow path that leads to life, a path where we walk about as carriers of your hope. Help us to bring that hope to the world around us, to the persons that gives us the coffee or the person that drops the mail off at our house or the person we stand behind or in front of at the line at the store, our neighbor, our friends, our family. May we be carriers of hope. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Church family, we love you guys so much.
I don't know what your week's going to look like, but we say it every week. Romans 8, Romans 8 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? We love you guys. We'll see you next week. Please help us with the chairs. Some glad morning when this life is over. I'll fly away to a land on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. Shadows of this life have gone. I'll fly away like a bird from prison bars have flown. I'll fly away. Jesus knows what he's doing.